I wanted you to have a chance to see what I see on Sunday morning, preaching to an empty house. And yet I know the church is gathering, like you, online, to be the church. And today we're going to talk about service. Service one another, the most vulnerable. Washing hands, social distancing, and worshiping together here on Christ Online. That's the message today. The battle is the Lord's, I will not fear. March on in victory. Welcome to worship here. Christ online, so glad you're here. We know that God is on the throne. We know that God is already victorious. He is greater than a germ and greater than any problems and fears that we have. So we're here to celebrate and worship his holy name. Thank you to Spirit Song for being here 
socially appropriately distanced there. That's great, and hope you are staying safe at home as well. If you're worshiping with us online, we'd like you to interact with our online minister, Alexis Williams. She is there to see if any prayer concerns or questions. We'd like to know where you're from. We've got a group from Canada who is worshiping with us. Welcome from to the north of the border. So tell us where you're from and tell us how many are gathered around. This might be a good time to start organizing like a, a home church, a handful of people who will worship regularly together because the battle is the Lord's we will not fear. So glad you're here to join us for worship at Christ Lutheran. Join us for song.
we know that a sin is a sin is a sin is a sin, right? We know that intellectually. We know that theologically. But I bet you do the same thing that I do. That is, I kind of rank them in my mind. I think of such things as um, murder, robbery, rape. Uh, those, those are bad sins. Those are worse sins. And then I probably think of things like, uh, I don't know, worry or fear or doubt. Uh, those are kind of the, the lesser sins. But is that right thinking? I've been thinking a lot about fear and worry, particularly this past week when there's a lot of anxiety and hysteria around the country. And I found this quote from John MacArthur. He said this, Worry by its nature is a product of the lack of faith and trust in God. Wow. If that's true, and it sounds like it is, then worry isn't one of those lesser and unconsequential type of sins. It's right there as one of the biggies. And so I want to invite you, as we enter into worship today, to think about the fear and the worry, the anxiety and the angst, not just the world, but are churning within you. And let's give it over to God. They are real emotions we're struggling with. We're going to put them at the throne of God and give it away. Would you join me for confession? Dear Lord, everything in the news tells me to worry. My mind, if left unchecked, gravitates towards worry. Lord, I worry about my health, my family, this country, this economy, my business, our world. Forgive me, O Lord, I worry. Strengthen my faith to put my utmost trust, not on the stimulus package or on sanitizers or social distancing, but on you. I give you my worry, O Lord. I trust in your peace. Amen. It is to the same God that we make our confess and confession towards is the one who says, come to me. All you who are weary, come to me. Those who are fearful, come to me. Those who worry. And I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. Certainly rest in the calming of the hearts and certainly rest in, in giving us strength to meet the day, but also rest with the gift of forgiveness. So as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit so that casting all our anxieties on him, he may take our worry away and replace it with the peace that passes all human understanding. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we will not be shaken. We will choose not to live in fear and angst. We will not join the hysteria because we know the battle is yours and you are victorious. So we gather here today in unusual circumstances, but we gather as the church. The church still exists and you are still our God. And so we give you thanks for the gift of technology that even though living apart, we can still be united together in one spirit in you. Bless us this day as we look at your word and that we may apply it to our lives and live as your people, the church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This past week, I had somebody make a comment to me and say, Wow, Scott, it's a tough time to be the church, isn't it? Yeah, it is. We are in the business of gathering people together. We are in the business of lives touching lives. And so it is tough preaching to an empty sanctuary. It is tough not gathering for Sunday school classes, rehearsal. It's, it is tough not having your small group gathering together. I, I get what he's saying. It is tough for the church but I know it's tough for a lot more people. Boy, it's tough if you're elderly, really feeling alone and cut off. It's, it's tough for those who are self-employed. It's tough for those who work for a restaurant or a bar or a pub. It's, it's tough. And it may be tough for us to do the business of the church. It's not tough for us to be the church. We're seeing this everywhere. As neighbors are checking on other neighbors, seeing if you have food and supply and, and medicine. As people are making sacrifices across this country, across the world, for the sake of, of others, we're, we're being the church. It seems to me that, ironically, how it took an act of Congress, literally, to say you can't worship together for us to really understand what it means to be the church. And what does that mean? First of all, it means that we are a people of prayer. We believe in the power of prayer. We talked about it last Sunday and last Wednesday for noon Lent and talked about how prayer is the very foundation of who we are. And, and we're not praying to some unknown, unnamed life force up there, wishing and hoping things go well. Jesus said, when you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven. And what we're saying by that is that we have a God who loves us and knows us as a caring parent, knows our needs before we even ask them, and invites us into this holy conversation of prayer that we get to be in his presence to speak and to listen to God. It is a great gift. You know, I heard somebody say that um, they didn't know what to do. There was nothing left to do. All I could do was just pray. And that sounds like a last resort to me. If we are people of prayer, prayer is not a last resort after we've exhausted everything else. It's the first resort. That we come to God for that strength and courage, guidance and wisdom to be able to get through not just this season of this virus, but through our entire lives. That's what it means to be the church. The second thing I thought about was that to be the church means to have this calming presence about us, to have a word of encouragement. I don't know about you, but I'm sure it's the same. My email is flooded with all sorts of people telling me how they're handling the coronavirus. 
I mean, I've got my Geico agent, my bank, my credit card. I've got my lawn care telling me how they are handling the credit. I even have my DISH network telling me all about the virus. Enough already. Enough. There's some over-communication going on. But listen, if they have something to say about the virus, how much more ought we, as the church, have something to say? That this will pass. That God still is on high. That, that God invites us to be strong and courageous let us know that he is victorious. He is bigger than any germ out there. That this God has us in his hands and calls us, do not worry, do not weep, do not be afraid. Now that's easier said than done, I understand. But in saying that, what he's doing is inviting us to, to cast that on his shoulders. Let him take all of that angst and let him replace it with a word of encouragement and hope that we receive and we give to one another. So, don't be silent about this. Don't ignore it. Be wise and prudent, but at the same time, let people know that this God's got this, and he will see us through. We're people of prayer. We've got a word to say and the third thing, it seems to me, is that now more than ever, we can be the church. We can be the example of what it means to be the church, even if we're not gathered together. I remember when I was a camp counselor, we, um, we had that song that said, they will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. They will know we are Christians by our love. Our neighbors know that we're Christians. They're watching. Will we live as people of faith? Will we live as people of hope? Or will we crumble with hysteria like the rest? And for that, I want to turn to our text for today. It comes from Philippians chapter 2. Let me read that. <clears throat> do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mind as Christ Jesus. We worship a great God and I'm reminded of that, particularly today. We came up with this theme months ago. We selected these texts months ago and how it aligns with what is going on right now can only happen through the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is about service here. This is about care and this is about being the church. And what's that look like? Let's break this down. The first part says this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. I know our egos get in the way all the time. It's really hard to separate the ego from what is right and good, and I know that line is fuzzy. But during this crisis right now, let's not use any of it to exploit other people. I say that because I read this past week of a guy in Tennessee who purchased $17,000 worth of hand sanitizer with the whole purpose of making an obscene profit. I don't know if it was Craigslist or eBay or Amazon. I, I don't know which one. But as he was selling it for a huge profit, the, the website figured it out and shut him down. We're not going to use this to exploit other people. Shut him down. Good. Now he's sitting at home with $17,000 of hand sanitizer. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. There will be opportunists during this time. If we're going to be the church, let's not join in. 
The second thing from this text, it says this. In humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Boy, there's been a lot of restrictions, bans, policy, guidelines on how we keep the distance and we, we um, self-quarantine, all good behavior. Man, we're practicing that at our own household. With most of our, all of our kids involved with the healthcare industry, they're around sick people every day. We're keeping that distance. They're not hanging out with their grandmother. That's just wise and prudent. But let me ask you the question. In following all of these guidelines and practices, why? Is it because you're ordered to do so? That's on the lowest level. Is it for self-preservation so you don't get it and you don't get harmed? That's a little bit higher up. But really, statistically, you and I, most of us are not going to get infected. And if we do get infected, statistically again, you and I probably will not die from this. So why do we go through all this sacrifice and inconvenience and trouble of separating ourselves and not having the contact and, and being alone? This is what this text is looking at. Don't do it for your own interests. We do it for the interest of the other. So we follow the guidelines. We do it. I mean, it's safe and it's prudent to do, but the primary reason we do it is for the sake of the elderly, for whom this is a very serious illness. We do it for the sake of our, of our friend who is undergoing cancer treatment or is asthmatic or has this suppressed immunity system. We do it for the sake of the other. We can do this. It's a short-term sacrifice that we can do as being the church for the sake of the other person. The last verse says this. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Now, we have to ask the question, what is that mindset of Christ Jesus? How did he live a life that was not self-serving, selfish, uh, vain conceit? How did he live out his life? And maybe one of the great examples of that would be on Monday, Thursday. After Jesus completed the last pass, uh, Passover meal with his disciples, do you remember what he did? He took off his outer garment and picked up a bowl and um, a cloth, and he went to each of the disciples and washed their feet. Now, maybe you've seen this done in some church services in which the pastor comes up to the front here, brings up a couple of the council people, the pastor takes off his stole, he um, unties the wingtip shoes, takes off the argyle socks, and puts some water on the feet of his council people. This is very different, what Jesus did. Boy, during a time in which there were no paved roads and poor sanitary conditions, the grossest part of the whole body were the feet, walking in this stuff every day. It was the job of the lowliest of the servants to greet the guests coming into the home, have them sit down, take off their sandals, and then toe by toe, foot by foot, soul by soul, Wipe off and clean the grime and the gunk of a full day of walking. That's what Jesus did. He washed the feet of the one who would deny him. He washed the feet of the one who would betray him. He washed the feet of the one who would doubt him. And he washed the feet of all of them who would run away from him. 
And when he got done, he said to them, a new commandment I give to you, to love one another the way I have loved you. To love one another the way I have loved you. Now, this is not a romantic love. This isn't a kind of a bro love. I love you, man. It's not that. This is love in action. They will know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Remember, Jesus said, no greater love has anyone than this. Remember? That he laid down his life for the sake of the other. Now, let's, let's not be too dramatic. Very few of us will ever be asked to lay down our life for the sake of the other. But during this time in our nation, in our world, what, what will you be called upon to lay down? No longer hoarding all the toilet paper and bread? That's a start. Lay that down. Lay that down. Maybe not having a big party and celebration for your birthday with all the people over? Lay it down. Maybe doing business and church in a new way. Yep. Lay it down. Not out of self-preservation. Not out of any rules that are out there from the government. But we lay it down out of love for the sake of the other person. We can be the church, even if we're not together. Because Jesus literally laid down his life, not out of any vain uh, pursuit, not out of any kind of self-gain, but he did it for the sake of the other. He did it for the sake of us. Because we are the most vulnerable. This sin is a disease that has worked its way through of all the world. We talk about a pandemic. A pandemic. This disease of sin has literally gone around the world. There is no one left unaffected by it. And this Jesus does what needs to be done, sacrifice for the sake of the other to make sure they're well, to make sure you and I are well. That's being the church. This week, find all sorts of ways in which you can be the church. We are called to be the hands and the voice and the feet of Jesus. Do it. This week, be the church. The hands of Jesus folded in prayer, praying for the strength and the wisdom and the hope. Being the voice of Jesus with a word of encouragement and faithfulness in the midst of the hysteria. And be the feet of Jesus, seeking out that one who is alone, who needs help with food or supplies or medicine. Together, apart, perhaps we can understand what it means to be the church as one. A tough time to be the church I know what he means by that. I, to do the business of the church, <clears throat> it is tough. But during this time, we might even echo Winston Churchill when he said, this will be our finest hour. <laughs> because it's no longer pious, churchy words to love one another as I have loved you. Words that we've heard, words that just go over our back. But now it makes sense. Now we can love one another the way Jesus has loved us through our prayer and through our words and through our feet, finding that one who's in need so that we, we can be the church. I want to conclude with telling you a little bit about what the church is doing. What, about 10 days ago, maybe, I sent out an email to the whole congregation saying that for the end of March that we'll be worshiping online. So I want to say thank you for joining us for that. 
Now, that's as far as we could go. You know as well as I do that long-term planning these days is maybe 72 hours. It changes quickly. So we're committed to doing online worship next Sunday as well, the 29th. And then the church council is going to gather together online to talk, I think it's the 30th or 31st, to see where do we go from here. I don't think any of us thinks on April 1st or 2nd the CDC is going to say, green light, everybody can just <clears throat> go back to your life. That's not going to happen, right? <clears throat> so we've got to figure out what that means for Holy Week, for Easter, and beyond. And I'll communicate that with you after council meets. Number two, communion. A lot of people have talked about how much they miss communion. To be the church is word and sacrament. We, we understand that. Throughout March, we've taken um, a communion fast. We've, uh, we've withheld that for a while. Until that time, we can meet face to face again. How long will that go? I'm in conversation with our bishops and with other larger churches across the country figuring out how to do communion anew in a time like this. I'm not sure, but I'll also communicate that with you as well. Another thing we're doing is Pastor Drew's put together a group called Noah's Helpers. What a great term, Noah's Helper. You know, Noah, Noah was under quarantine for a long time, wasn't he? And he needed help. We're going to do the same thing. We know that there are those particularly 75 and older that we're reaching out to, giving them a call, finding out what they need. And then we've got an army of volunteers who are ready to be deployed to be the hands and the voice and the feet of Jesus. Again, with, with food or supplies or medicine, whatever you might need. If you're in that situation and you need help, call the church office. If you'd like to be a part of the army of Noah's helpers, let us know that as well. But finally, let me say this. I do a lot of different jobs and wear a lot of different hats at this church, but at the very top of all that I do, understanding my call here, it's to be your pastor. And so if you're going through I don't know, particular worry or fear, if you're having a deep struggle, I don't want you to go through that alone. I want you to give me a call. Or the other pastors. That's our number one priority. To speak with you, to pray with you, to be with you. You, you need not go through this alone. It may have taken an act of Congress to send us away. But it's going to take this whole new understanding of doing church anew. That we're truly going to be the church, one to another. And we want to be your pastors, particularly during this time. Let's close in prayer. Gracious God, I want you to calm the hearts of those who are going through difficult times of anxiety, stress, panic. Lord, you have not abandoned us. You are still our God. We still trust in your presence here among us, even in this new and strange way. Lord, open our eyes in ways that we can be the church. And we can be present for one another, even as you are here and everywhere else present for us. In all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Star are there to show me who you are. I can be sure your fingerprints are everywhere. 
every move, by every breath, we're meant to point to your greatness. There's nothing made that was not made to show your power. These hands were made to praise you. These lips were made to lift you up. I give to you my life and worship. Oh. our faith in God using our creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten of not me, of the one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we listen to a spirit song play, I want to uh, encourage you about your commitment to the church. 
Uh, we at Church, uh, Christ Lutheran have made a commitment to be able to pay our hourly staff at least through March, hopefully longer. These are many people who really count on this income for their livelihood. And so even as we're making this commitment to them, I'm asking you to make your commitment to the church so that we can care for them as well. There's a variety of ways in which you can continue your offerings. A few of them will be on the screen there for you. But I want to thank you in advance for being such a generous congregation and together being the church. This morning, saw a world full of trouble. Now I thought, how do we ever get so far down? And how's it ever gonna turn around? So I turned my eyes to heaven. I thought, God, why don't you do something? Well, I just couldn't bear the thought of people living in poverty and children sold into slavery. The thought disgusted me, so I shook my fist at heaven. I said, God, why don't you do something? said I did, yeah, I created you, now listen, if not us, then who, if not me and you, right now, well, it's time for us to do something, it's time for us to do something, if not now, Like angels of apathy who tell ourselves it's all right, somebody else will do something. Somebody else will do something. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of life with no desire. I don't want to flame, I want to fire. I want to be the one who stands up and says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something. If not us, then who?
As we come together today to be the church, one of the ways that we live out our faith is by drawing near to the throne of God in prayer. Will you pray with me? Lord, it's time for us to to do something, to be the body of Christ that you have called us to be. Father, we pray that you would make us people of bold prayer right now, people who are patient in the unknown and the uncertainty, who are a reflection of calm, of peace, of hope, confident in your compassion, willing to lay down life for the sake of the other, O Lord. We pray, O God, that you would show us in days of great change and uncertainty how to be certain that you are always with us, that you are as you name yourself, Emmanuel, God with us. And at a time when it seems like everyone has something to say about the coronavirus, Lord, make us as the church courageous in our words that we say to point people to the crucified, the risen Savior, our shepherd, our friend, our Messiah. Oh Lord, we thank you for the coming of springtime around us, which in the midst of a period that's frightening for many, the the beauty of spring is a reason to hope, a reason to be reminded that um, life breaks forth still in our midst, Lord, with the blooming of the flowers, the birds, the, the, all the sights that we see, Lord. We pray that you would let that be a reminder of resurrection, of the future that you have in store that is bright for your people, for your world that you love. Lord, we do pray for your church, the church that's gathered online for Christ Lutheran at all three of our campuses, Christ South, Christ Concord, and Christ Providence. We thank you for all your church churches and congregations that are gathered today around our country, our world. Lord, be with us in this Lenten journey, in prayer and fasting and giving and serving. Conform our lives to the one who calls us to take up our cross and to follow him. Help us to be people of encouragement. Lord, we thank you for being the great healer. We pray for countries where the coronavirus has hit especially hard, for um, Italy, for places, other countries in Europe and Asia. Lord, we pray for the people on our prayer list as well today that we lift up praying for Lisa, for Steve and Donna, Stuart and David, Diane and Ruth, for Karen's mother Jackie, for Steve, for Whitney and Joey. We pray for those whose hearts are heavy with grief, for Paul on the death of his mother Noretta, for the family of Nancy, for Jane and her family as they grieve the death of her son Sean. Lord, at the same time, we thank you for births and for um, those who are new parents welcoming children into their life. We thank you for Nick and Angela on the birth of their daughter, Catherine, and for Bill and Kathy, their daughter, Maggie, and her husband on the birth of Bill and Kathy's grandson, Richard Blake. Lord, hear the names of others. We lift to you a louder in silence today. Oh God, who calls us to kneel down and wash feet. Maybe not actual feet, O oh Lord, but the feet of our neighbors who come to us in need. We pray that you would help us this week to, to see those opportunities as they come our way and to respond, to do something, knowing that you have placed us here for a reason, for a purpose. Lord, we ask that you would bless those people in our society right now who are being people of tremendous service for hospital staff and workers, medical workers, for those who work in grocery stores and other retail stores, for delivery drivers, for those who are cleaning and custodian uh, workers. Lord, we pray you bless them, keep them safe. Thank you for their courage 
and their willingness to model a servant heart. Lord, send us out this week with good faith, with great hope, and most of all, ready to love as you have loved us. Now all these things we pray in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who taught us to pray. And now may Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thanks for joining us here on Christ Online. This, this week, I want you to be the church that is to help those who are in need by doing the small parts that we can do to be able to work together for the common good to reduce the threat of this virus. Thanks for being the church here on Christ Online.